Amen. Amen. Thank you. you. May be seated. What a wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord. Amen. Please take your Bibles and turn to the book of Acts. We're in Acts chapter 27, looking tonight at verses 27 through 37. We're on part two, spiritual versus physical shipwrecks. We tend to think of physical shipwrecks as something very scary, very exciting, and if you ever see movies with a ship that's tossed at sea, I've seen a good number of those kind of movies back in the days when I used to watch pirate movies, all kinds of storms at sea and things like that. I haven't seen one of those in a long time, but anyway, kind of scary, kind of exciting, people being washed across the deck, washed overboard. But you know, it's even more scary and more dangerous to have a spiritual shipwreck, and yet it's happening all around us. Perhaps it's happened to some of us, and nobody seemed to care. There didn't seem to be any lifeboats out there. There didn't seem to be anybody who was looking out from the lighthouse to see if there were sailors in distress. And there were spiritual shipwrecks going on all around us, but we were not focused on that. We were focused on the things of earth. We're in Acts chapter 27. I'm going to read the introductory passage once again, as I did last week. The preceding verses, verses 13 through 20, though tonight we're actually looking at the latter part of the chapter. And when the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, loosing thence they sailed close by Crete. But long, not long after there arose against it a tempestuous wind called Eurachlidon. And when the ship was caught and could not bear up into the wind, we let her drive. And running under a certain island, which is called Clauda, we had much work to come by the boat, which when they had taken up, they used helps undergirding the ships, fearing lest they should fall into the quicksands, strike sail, and so were driven. We began exceedingly tossed with the tempest. The next day they lightened the ship. And the third day we cast out with our own hands the tackling of the ship. When neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. Last week we gave as an introduction to physical and spiritual shipwrecks a joining together of the doctrine of communication, election, and the sovereignty of God to the predestined storms in our lives. Just very briefly, you recall we talked about the elect. We saw that that term was used in seven different ways in Scripture. We saw that in every case it's God making a choice, choosing an individual or a group for specific preordained purposes. We saw that the term elect was used of Christ. It's used of holy angels in contrast to fallen angels. It's used of Israel in the Old Testament. It's used of Israel during the Great Tribulation period. It's used of God's children in every dispensation who call on him. It's used of believers in the church age, and it is used to describe local churches composed of real believers. Then we looked at the related term election and saw that it fell into four categories. First category, the term election is used in the New Testament of national Israel in contrast to the church. Second category, the term election is used in the New Testament to distinguish between believing Jews from non-believing Jews. Third category, we saw the term election is used of individual believers in the church age. The fourth category, we saw that fourth, there are three essential character qualities to election. The first element, election is not based on works. Speaking of Jacob and Esau, Paul talks about that in Romans 11 and 9. The second element, we saw election is based on grace, Romans 11 also. Third element, election does not negate human responsibility, and Peter makes that clear in 2 Peter 1.10. Then we began our study of election in relation to predestination and began to make practical application of these great doctrines to the storms that we personally face in our lives. If God elects, if God predestines, why do we have to go through so much trouble? And that brought us down to verse 21. But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, ye should have hearkened unto me and not to have loosed from Crete and to have gained this harm and loss. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. 
For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and, lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God. Now, folks, that is the number one key to the storms in your life. I believe God. Don't believe the voice of the storm. Don't believe the voice of the world. Don't believe the voice of the flesh, which is rebelling against the storm. Don't believe the devil, who wants you to doubt God. Don't believe the demons, who are prodding you on to run the other direction. I believe God. Whatever storm you're facing right now, that's the bottom line. That's the bottom line. Don't see many taking notes. Write it down. The bottom line for the predestined storms in our lives is I believe God. That's a powerful statement and it tells us something about not only Paul, but it tells us something about God. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God, that it shall be even as it was told me. No changes, no ifs, ands, or buts, no partial fulfillment, no haphazard fulfillment, no allegorical fulfillment, as the amillennial crowd would have you believe on future doctrines. It will be fulfilled exactly, literally, precisely as God has promised it in his word. Howbeit, we must be cast upon a certain island. For when the fourteenth night was come, as we were driven up and down in Adria, notice it took some time. They still continued on as they were being driven about. About midnight the ship and deemed that they would that they drew near to some country, and sounded, and found it twenty fathoms, and when they had gone a little further they sounded again and found it fifteen fathoms. In other words, they're coming up to shore very quickly. Then fearing lest we should have fallen upon rocks, they cast four anchors out of the stern and wished for the day. There were some people who didn't believe it. They were going to save themselves. God wasn't going to let anybody save themselves. Doesn't matter whether you're Jew or Gentile, doesn't matter whether you're a prisoner or a free man, you cannot save yourself. The shipmen were about to flee out of the ship when they had let down the boat into the sea under color that so they would have cast anchors out of the foreship. They weren't going to cast anchors out of the foreship. They were going to take the boat and make for shore and let the ship be beaten to death by the waves. Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, except these abide in the ship, you cannot be saved. You want us all to be saved or you want just them to be saved? The centurion had learned a lesson from a man who believed God. I hope you take that into account next time you are tempted to panic and there are unbelievers standing around you. Then the soldiers cut off the ropes of the boat and let her fall off. And while the day was coming on, Paul besought them all to take meat, saying, This day is the fourteenth day that you've tarried and continued fasting, having taken nothing. Wherefore I pray you to take some meat, for this is for your health, for there shall not an hair fall from the head of any of you. And when he had thus spoken, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. And when he had broken it, he began to eat. Then were they all of good cheer, and they also took some meat. And we were in all the ship, two hundred, threescore, and sixteen souls. We, Luke, was there. This is a first-hand narrative. This is not embellished by someone who passed it to someone who passed it to someone who passed it to someone. 
What we saw last week was that God predestined the 276 people would live through the storm, no doubt the storm of the century, and then would be cast on a certain island, which God had foreordained a specific island because he wanted Paul to go there, because he wanted Paul to preach there, because he wanted Paul to heal the father of a very important man on that island so that suddenly they would have free reign of the entire island for the entire winter so that Paul could plant a church there. You never know what God's going to do when he brings you through a storm of life so that he might do his mighty work through you. The experiences of the storms of life are designed to refine you and me into the men and women of God that God wants us to be. How are we responding to the storms that have come to our lives? Are we allowing Christ to transform us by the Spirit of God through those things that we face in this world so that we look above the world and we look to Christ so that others will see him through us? Folks, these are some of the most important lessons in the book of Acts. I hope you're getting them. Although the carnal mind does not like the doctrine of predestination, predestination means that God predetermines our ultimate final destination and the destination of all morally accountable creatures. That's the angels in advance. He predetermines the outcome solely with two things in mind. Number one, his glory. And number two, the ultimate best of his elect. Predestination rate relates to the elect and their best good. It also relates to some other things as we've seen. We learn that predestination is an expression of the sovereign will of God, not the will of man. Now, last week I broke it down for you into 10 different categories so that you could understand it more easily. There were 10 categories. The first three we saw related to salvation to make us fully aware that salvation is a work of God and not a work of man. Category one was salvation part one, being made children of God by adoption. And I explained that that means we're full heirs with Christ by legal adoption so that we are personally recognized by the Father as sons and rightful heirs. Second, category two, salvation part two. That was being made children of God through sanctification. God sets us apart in such a way that we will not die before the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit takes place at the precise moment that God himself causes us to have faith. That's very important. We've been chosen to salvation through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. 2 Thessalonians 2.13 Category number three, salvation part three, being made children of God by faith. So made children of God by adoption, being made children of God by sanctification, the setting apart in eternity past prior to our actual trusting Christ. And three, salvation, being made children of God by faith. Because God gives faith to the elect. It's not something you work up inside yourself. God gives faith to the elect as a sovereign gift. You all know Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. We didn't look at that last week, but let me just recall it for you. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. When he speaks of faith, the nearest antecedent to that, in both Greek and in English, the nearest antecedent to faith is gift. Gift and faith go together. It, that is faith, is the gift of God not of works, lest any man should boast. And we saw that very specifically stated by the Apostle Paul in Acts 13, 48. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord, and as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. The ones that didn't believe were not ordained to eternal life. If somebody does not believe and does not believe and does not believe and does not believe and, not believe and dies, they are accountable, we've already seen that, but it also means that they were not ordained to eternal life. 
That is certainly a doctrine that is hated not only by Armenians, but certainly by those who are not ordained to eternal life. We don't understand it. Some people say it's not fair. But frankly, what's not fair is that God should choose any of us. If we got what we deserved, we would all end in hell. God is not obligated to me. God is not obligated to you to do anything for us. God is not obligated, certainly, to give us eternal life when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, when we were in vile rebellion against God, when we were wicked and evil in our hearts, when we wanted nothing to do with God. He was not obligated to save us, to give us faith, to transform us by the Spirit of God, to bring us from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of life. God was under no obligation to any of us. If you think he was under obligation, you don't understand grace. If you think that he should have done it anyway, you don't understand mercy. Grace is extended to those who are guilty. Mercy is extended to those who are miserable because of their sin. Then we look at category five, excuse me, category four. We are predestined to an eternal inheritance. It's at that point, and this is new, what the things that I'm adding in between here. Now we move to predestination and things that come that God graciously adds to our secure salvation. After the first three categories, which deal with salvation, category four begins to deal with things that God adds to us following our secure salvation, in whom we've attained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his own will. And the next thing that God gives to us, category five, predestined to have and to exercise specific spiritual gifts. So we've talked about what God did in eternity past and the things that brought us to time present. Eternity past, God chose us. And then he, as we move forward in the time sequence, he set us apart by the Spirit of God to make sure we didn't die before we got saved. And then he gave us faith at the moment of regeneration. And then we saw that God has given us an inheritance in the heavenly places, an inheritance is not something you work for. An inheritance is given to you because the Father chooses to give it to you. You're not, he's not required to give it to you. He wouldn't have to, he could give it to somebody else. He might give one share to a one child and a different kind of share to a different child. He might have a child who loves the water and so he gives him his crisscraft criss craft cruise boat, that little yacht out there. Another kid may be terrified of the water, but he loves to climb mountains, so he gives him all of his mountain gear. Another kid just likes to stay home and milk cows, so he gives him the farm. God isn't required to give us all precisely the same things. He's made each one of us different, but we all have an inheritance that's incorruptible, eternal in the heavens. But he gives us for present time for the exercise of our ministry in the body of Christ and as a testimony to the world, specific spiritual gifts. That deals with our current special responsibilities in time present right now. We saw category six, predestinated for a special offering up to God. That deals with the sacrifice of first fruits. We only went through that very briefly last week. I'm going to give you some more information on that tonight. So this is new material you're about to get. On the Feast of First Fruits, we saw that it is the result of the sovereign predestinating will of God that we would be a first fruits. That was in James 1.18 where we, we saw the topic introduced of his own will begat he us with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Now, this is new material. I want to divide the New Testament use of the word first fruits and add some explanations to the verses that we just zipped through last week. All new material, if you're taking notes, I hope you are. I'm going to divide the New Testament references to first fruits into five divisions. Five divisions of first fruits. 
First division. First fruits is used to speak of the first budding of new spiritual life in the believer that makes him or her yearn for the transformation of the body either at the rapture or at the resurrection. Let me say that again. First fruits is used to speak of the first budding of new spiritual life in the believer that makes him or her yearn for the transformation of the body at the resurrection or the rapture. When the new life bursts out, it suddenly realizes what a dead and wicked world this is. It suddenly makes him or her realize what glories are promised to us in heaven and it makes him or her yearn either for the imminent return of Christ. I hope that is your desire, that you have not been so dulled in your thinking that you only think about things of earth. It makes him or her yearn to see Jesus. We see it that way in Romans 8.23. Not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. You begin to groan, you begin to yearn. This body has got an old sin nature. Oh, how Paul hated that. The things he wanted to do, he couldn't do. The things he didn't want to do, he did them. He yearned to see Christ. He didn't know how it was going to happen, but he knew it was going to happen. That's at Romans chapter 8. The passage in Romans 8, 9, 10, and 11 that deal with predestination. He didn't want to take his own life, but he wanted to serve Christ in this life but while that was going on, oh, how he yearned to see Jesus, how he prayed for the rapture. But he knew that there were still those who were lost. They're elect. They'll be saved, Paul. Don't worry about it. Paul understood election better than you do and better than I do. And yet look at how he preached Christ, what he suffered so that others might hear. Never use election and predestination as an excuse for being slothful in your testimony and witness. Paul's the one who taught you everything you know about predestination. Not this preacher. If you've read your Bibles, it's Paul who articulates and refines and defines and gives to us revelation from God concerning this very central doctrine of the faith. And yet that certainly didn't lull him into sleep. You look at the things he suffered. Read 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Including this shipwreck here. He mentions it. Except he talks about two other shipwrecks too. First roots. The budding of the new spiritual life in the believer that makes him or her yearn for the transformation of the body at the resurrection or at the rapture. Second. That is why Christ is called the first fruits of them that slept. That's also in Roman, uh, excuse me, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 20 and 23. Christ is the first fruits of them that slept. First we saw about that new budding desire to be with Christ, to have the body of sin transformed. There are only two ways that happens, either at the resurrection or at the rapture. Why? Because Christ is called the first fruits of them that slept. 1 Corinthians 15, 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Verse 23. But every man in his own order. Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ that is coming. Third. Third. First fruits is also used of the very first believers in a particular region to come to Christ. First fruits is also used of the very first believers in a particular region to come to Christ. And I tell you what joy that brings 
to the evangelist or the missionary or the pastor because you know what first fruits means? First fruits means that a harvest is coming. When a missionary or an evangelist sees the first souls saved, it's not just because he's glad that at least somebody responded. He's delighted because this is the first fruits of this region. He goes to an island that's never heard Christ. He preaches and he preaches and suddenly somebody comes to Christ. Why does he rejoice? Because it's the first fruits. Let me give you a couple of verses about that. Romans chapter 16, verse 5. We find that this word first fruits, by the way, is used of, of the same region of an individual and of a family. So first fruits of an individual and first fruits of a family in the same region who came to Christ. One is mentioned over in Romans 16. The other is mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Listen. Romans 16, 5. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Salute my well-beloved Epinetus, who is the first fruits of Achaia unto Christ. So here's an individual believer who's called first fruits. But in the region of Achaia, we see a family also over in 1 Corinthians 16, 15, who are called first fruits. I beseech you, brethren, you know the house of Stephanas, that it is the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. Paul talks about it in two epistles. And he talks about an area where he saw some exciting things happening. The very first individual to come to Christ. The very first family to come to Christ. And the first individual called well-beloved had a very special impact on the Apostle Paul. The very first family. Oh, what an incredible first fruits because they have addicted. You know what an addict is. You know what a cocaine addict is. You know what a heroin addict is. You know what a marijuana addict is. You know what a drug addict is. It's somebody who cannot do without the drug. And they will do anything. They will spend everything they have because they're addicted to it. They will give their very lives to get it. They will go into dangerous places to get it. They will deal with the most seedy characters to get it. Do you understand that's true for those who are addicted to the ministry? They will spend everything they've got for it. They will do anything they can to accomplish it. They will go among seedy characters. They go, will go into dangerous areas because they are addicted to the ministry. And they do it especially for the saints, for the believers. Oh, that we would have some here like that. Fourth, first fruits is also used of the Heavenly Father imparting divine seed of faith in the believer who bursts out with the new life. Just as a father gives the seed that generates new life in the mother, so that a new life will burst forth and a child will be born. That is the way in which this word is used in the key verse that we started with tonight, James 1.18. First fruit is used of the Heavenly Father imparting the divine seed of faith in the believer who bursts out with new life. James 1.18 again of his own will, now listen to the next word, begat he us with the word of truth. He implanted the seed of the word that brought forth the life. I know you've read through those very dull, or I hope you have, because they're not that dull, 
genealogies of the Old Testament. Some time ago, I was preaching through the genealogies, and I talked about the genealogies of Jesus. So and so begat so and so, begat so and so, who begat so and so, who begat so and so, who begat so and so. And you go, oh no, what are we doing? And then we began to look at the names, and then we began to look at the connections, and then we began to see how God was working all of human history together to that one precise moment in time where the Lord Jesus Christ was brought into the world without a man through the virgin birth. And yet, Mary, his biological mother, and Joseph, his legal father, though not his physical father, both tracked back to David so that he was the rightful heir to the throne. Don't overlook that tiny little word, begat. He begat us, and certainly by his grace, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Fifth, number five. It is also used of those who are morally pure in the book of Revelation. Those who have burst forth with new life that has not been defiled. First fruits is used of those who are morally pure in the book of Revelation. Those who have burst forth with new life that has not been defiled. <coughs> Revelation 14.4 these are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. The first fruits. A very special group that deals with 144,000, 12,000 male Jews. God keeps record of who's Jewish and who's not, even though there's been a great deal of diversity and scattering all over the face of the earth. And I told you about how I had visited a place called Kaifeng in China, where a group of Jews traveled after Titus destroyed the city of Jerusalem in 70 AD. This group of Jews walked all the way from Israel, all the way to China, and established a synagogue and kept the Jewish traditions going for the last 2,000 years. And I think I've mentioned to you at some time in one of my messages that just about a week and a half ago, I read a New York Times article that said the Chinese government has come down on all the non-approved religions. And since Judaism is not a approved religion in China, they've gone in and destroyed all the traces of the synagogue, including the ancient well that dates back to the time of those original Jews who came to China. And they've begun to persecute them and not let them meet together. Although some in the article, it's a quite extended article, are meeting secretly, the just like Christians in the early church, and they don't meet openly. But the reporter who was writing the article talked about how he was able to find at least one or two of them. and and talk to them about what was going on. You don't see that kind of thing normally reported. Look it up, New York Times, Kaifeng, Synagogue, K-A-I-F-E-N-G. It will break your heart. But there are still 12,000 Jewish males out of each of the 12 tribes that God has preserved through the centuries in every generation and certainly in that final generation who are called first fruits. God has preserved them. That brings us to our next category. Predestined to bear spiritual fruit. 
That's the visible proof of predestination and election. Because you see, without the bearing of fruit, that's Galatians 5. Now we see works also, that's the next category. But without the bearing of fruit, you don't have any visible proof of predestination and election. You see, people with plastic fruit, they've got plastic bananas hanging on their dead tree. But it's not real fruit. The fruit of the Spirit is love. That's where it starts. Love is defined for us in 1 Corinthians 15. If you say you have love and it doesn't match 1 Corinthians 15, it's counterfeit. Excuse me, 1 Corinthians 13. 15 is the resurrection. If you say that you have love and it doesn't match 1 Corinthians 13, it's the plastic banana on the dead tree. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy. Joy is always seen in the darkest hours. Every place it shows up in Scripture, it's sent against a very black background. What are we talking about here? The storms of life? Peace. That means not being antsy and panicking, like the children of Israel did at the edge of the Red Sea. Are you bearing the fruit of the Spirit as you go through the storms of life? Long-suffering. Putting up with obnoxious people, not just difficult circumstances. Gentleness. Goodness. Faith. Meekness. Temperance. Are you among the elect? then you have been predestined to bear spiritual fruit. That's the visible proof of predestination, the visible fruit of election or proof. John 15, 16. Jesus said so. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. Now there's election. And ordained you, predestination, that ye should go and bring forth fruit. Don't say, well, it's not really applied to me. It applies to all those really spiritual Christians. No. It's the visible proof in your life, in the storms of life, that you belong to Jesus. That he has chosen you. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. All ninefold fruit of the Spirit are mentioned in John chapters 14, 15, and 16. Paul didn't make that list up. Jesus lists every one of them although not all defined for us. Paul gives them to us in a, a, a bundle altogether. But every one is discussed in John 14, 15, and 16. When I first saw that, it was after I'd worked all night at the radio station at Dallas Seminary. And I came pedaling back, and it was after midnight. And I always tried to have some devotional time before I went to sleep because I knew I'd have to get up at 7 o'clock and go to classes. And I was reading John chapter 14 and 15 and 16 and I began to realize suddenly, wait a minute, Jesus just talked about this. Jesus just talked about this. Love, joy, always over. peace is over here. My peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth you unto you. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. I mean, all of a sudden, he began to, and I said, wow, that's a bunch of the fruit of the Spirit. And, and the joy of discovery. I mean, I didn't read this in some book somewhere. It was from studying the Scripture. And I thought, man, if we got those fruit of the Spirit, I wonder if Jesus talked about these other ones. And then I began to look for them in that passage, and I found them. Jesus said it. You've not chosen me, but I've chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. 
that whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he may give it you. If you're not in fruit-bearing mode, you're not going to get answers to your prayer requests that are yes answers. That brought us to category 8, which ties in directly with category 7. Not only are we predestined to bear fruit, but we are predestined to manifest specific good works to the glory of God. Remember, those are works that meet those tests. It's got to be done in the power of the Holy Spirit. It's got to be done in obedience to the Word of God. It's got to be done to the glory of God. If you lack any of those things, it is not a good work because God is the one who defines what good works are. If you do it in the power of the flesh and not the power of the Spirit, even though it appears good on the outside to everybody else around you, if you're doing it in the flesh, it's not a good work. If you are doing something that seems to be a good work, but it's in disobedience to the Word of God, it is not a good work. If you are doing something for your own personal aggrandizement, for your own personal popularity, and not to the glory of God, it is not a good work. It's been ordained. If you're not showing good works in your life, it's one of the proofs that you are not among God's elect. Because Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Do you see any fruit in your life? Do you see any good works from God's perspective? in your life? If you don't, you better examine yourself, as Paul says, that you be in the faith, lest you be reprobate. You don't get saved by good works. If you believe that, you believe the lie, and you're definitely not saved. But if you are saved, both the fruit of the Spirit will show up in your life and good works will show up in your life. Works that please God. Maybe don't please other people. Like you're out there witnessing on the street and you tell a sodomite that he's lost and headed for hell and he needs to trust Jesus not only to save him but to change his life. That's what Paul talks about over in Romans and over in 1 Corinthians. Such were some of you, but now you're washed, now you're cleansed. People won't like that. But you're telling them the truth. Category 9. We talked a little bit about that last week, but I want to give you more tonight. Predestination is part of the eternal counsels of God concerning the future work of Christ. Now, I didn't go into this last week, but that is the principal theme of John chapter 5, beginning in verse 20. The eternal counsels of God concerning the future work of Christ. Jesus himself taught this in the book of John, and Paul repeated it in his sermons in Acts. If you have your Bibles, turn over to John chapter 5 for a moment, because I want to spend a couple of minutes here. This is all new material. John chapter 5, beginning in verse 20. For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that himself doeth. And he will show him greater works than these, that you may marvel. For as the Father raiseth up the dead, and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. Now, we're in the context of resurrections right now. We saw some resurrections in the Old Testament. The people understood the concept. The Lord Jesus Christ raised several people from the dead in the New Testament. They understood the context. What happens at the resurrection? For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment to the Son. 
This takes us back to the eternal counsels of God. <coughs> There's a purpose for it. It's given to us in the very next verse. That all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father which hath sent him. If you don't honor the Son, what are you going to expect at the resurrection when the Son does the judging? People talk about believing in God, but they don't really believe in Jesus. We believe in God up there, and they tell you all kinds of, maybe even theologically accurate things. I mean, I talk to friends in Israel who could tell me all sorts of accurate theological things about God out of the Old Testament, but they didn't honor Jesus. Are they saved? No. If they never trust Christ when they die, and when they're raised from the dead and stand at the judgment before his bar, will he be pleased with them? The Father hath committed all judgment to the Son. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that hath sent me hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Verily, verily, I say unto the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he's the Son of Man. You see, he's the second Adam. The first Adam blew it. The first Adam brought death into the world. The second Adam brings life into the world. The first Adam brought both physical death and spiritual death into the world. The second Adam brings both physical life and spiritual life into the world. He gives you spiritual life now when you trust in him. He gives you physical life at the resurrection. And he's going to judge all men because all men will be raised from the dead. Which category are you in? Because Adam brought physical death, all men are going to get physical life. But he brought spiritual death, and only those who believe in Christ will get spiritual life. And he hath given authority to him to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. The unbelievers are also going to be raised and condemned to hell. There is no annihilation. There is no soul sleep. Jesus will judge them all. Paul reiterated that in Acts chapter 10, verse 42. Predestination in relation to judgment. <coughs> verse 42, And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and the dead. Acts 10.42. Paul didn't pull any punches. That brings us to category 10, the one that most people hate. Reprobation is also predestined. Reprobation is also predestined. For there are certain men, Jude 1.4, there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation turning the grace of God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Second Peter warns about them. First Peter warns about them. Jesus talked about the tares among the wheat. We find the Apostle Paul talking about the apostates. They are there. Satan himself appears as an angel of light. Therefore it is no great marvel if his ministers appear as ministers of light. Reprobation is also predestined. 
I hope to get a lot farther than this tonight. All I did was add some things to last week, but I want to talk about the different kinds of spiritual shipwreck that a man may have in the storms of life. There are seven categories of those. It looks like I'm going to have to extend it for another week, but anyway, with those things in mind, we can be confident that the storms in our lives are designed by God to cause us to reach the specific destination that he's planned for us because God always reaches his goal. Paul looked at the multiple shipwrecks with confidence that he had had, that those things were designed by God to make him into the man that God wanted him to be. Thrice I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I've been in the deep. And that brings us to where I had wanted to start tonight with new material, but God gave me new insights into that first half. So we'll have to care for next week. The spiritual shipwreck being a different matter. Holding faith in a good conscience, which some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck. Conscience and faith are the first two things that we learn about spiritual shipwrecks. Not knowing how to cleanse your conscience. Walking against faith, trying to walk by sight. It will always be the compass that guides you to the rocks. Our gracious Heavenly Father, once again we thank you for the privilege of looking into your word, giving things that weren't actually planned for tonight, although you gave them at the last minute, because for some reason you wanted us to hear it wanted me to hear it because you first gave it to me that I might apply it to myself then to all of us together Father we pray that you will help us as we go through the storms of life to say with the Apostle Paul I believe God We believe you because you've given us your word. <coughs> your word is the final authority. It is your word that is our compass and our guide and our stay. Not the defiled conscience. Not the attempt to walk by sight instead of walking by faith. <coughs> it's your word. I believe God. Thank you, Father, for your word once again. Bless it to our hearts as your Holy Spirit applies it to us. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.